Well, Dr. Johan Rockstrom, welcome to the Clement Pod. Thanks. Pleasure joining. Well, it's so, it's so nice to be able to meet you over Zoom and to be able to have this conversation. So, I, And I wanted to reach out, as you know, because you were quote, quoted last month in The Guardian talking about climate sensitivity, saying this is the holy grail of climate science, and this is the, you know, the prime indicator of climate risk. I'm not a climate science a scientist, but I care a great deal about climate science and understanding climate science, as I know many of our listeners do. Can you tell us what is climate sensitivity and, and why does it matter? Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the, the way to explain this is that when, when we burn fossil fuels and cut down forests and change the composition of, of nitrogen and phosphorus and, and uh, chemical composition in the atmosphere, we, we generate an energy imbalance. We, we cause an unbalance in the global energy system. And the energy comes from the sun, warms up the planet, and long wave radiation exits back to space. And that equilibrium is what keeps the planet in, a, in, a, in an equilibrium state. And when we cause this injection of greenhouse gases, we then increase the energy absorption capacity of the planet. And the climate sensitivity is, is a metric to try and in one number represent how much will the, will the planet or the atmosphere warm at a doubling of the amount of carbon dioxide put into the atmosphere by us humans. So it is a it is a measure of the sensitivity of the planet to the disturbance caused by us humans when we emit greenhouse gases. And because it's, a, it's an emerging property of um, the climate models, so it's not a, it's not a number that is, that is defined as an input to the model, it is what comes out as a result of the model. You could, you could call it, the reason why I use the word holy grail is that Everything we know, which we put into the model, so how the ocean energy balance works, how ice reflects incoming solar radiation back to space, how ice melts, how soils absorb carbon, functioning of all the biological and physical components of, of the Earth system, all together, plowed into the whole modeling efforts, and out comes a result, which is then how much is the planet warming? And this becomes a measure of how sensitive the planet is. And, and finally, one, one reason why this metric is, 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 is important is that we, we know from climate physics that if it were only for the carbon dioxide, then um, just, just the energy physics of the planet, when you double the amount of carbon dioxide, would would lead only to something like one degree celsius warming and the only th reason why the warming exceeds one degree celsius at a doubling is is the is the feedbacks from the earth system and, and the most prominent feedback is is water vapor so when we warm up the planet you get more evaporation from the oceans you get more water in the atmosphere water is in itself a greenhouse gas so that's an example of one of the feedback dynamics, but you have other feedbacks. So you have feedbacks when ice melts and the surface gets darker and absorbs right. more heat. You have another feedback when you get more or less clouds and clouds can be both cooling and warming. And you have a whole bunch of these feedbacks. So the, the climate sensitivity is a measure of the, of the cumulative net impacts of these feedbacks. And you were obviously quoted in that same Guardian piece by Jonathan Waltz saying that you were very concerned what, what you were seeing with the outputs of some of these new climate models with regards to climate sensitivity. What have you noticed um, recently that has you concerned? Mm. Well, there, there is a, a concern arising. Um, and to understand that concern, one, one should actually go back all the way to um, at least to, to the 1970s, because the first estimates of the so-called equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is the, the, the final state of, of the temperature after forcing with a doubling of carbon dioxide, um, you know, after the, the atmosphere, at least the estimate is after the atmosphere has settled again, was already in the 1970s estimated at three degrees. So three degrees Celsius was the, the, the best estimate of, uh, so we double 
the amount of carbon dioxide from 280 ppm, which is the pre-industrial concentration in the atmosphere, to 560 ppm. This corresponds to something like roughly four watts per square meter. So it's, a, it's quite a significant increased energy imbalance. And since 1979, through five different IPCC reports, this number has stayed very, very stable. So despite all the advancements in, in our observations, in our efforts of looking into the paleoclimatic record, in our efforts of observations and climate models, the, the average uh, climate sensitivity has remained around three degrees Celsius at a doubling of CO2 with an uncertainty range from 1.5 to 4.5, essentially. So a very wide uncertainty range, which has always been a concern because if, if the planet would only warm at 1.5 degrees Celsius at a doubling of CO2, remember that 280 ppm is before the Industrial Revolution 150 years ago. We're today at 415. We're on our way to doubling. We would be doubling sometime you know, it will take us a few decades, but it's, but it's, we're, we're unfortunately moving in that direction. So of course, it really matters if the planet would warm only one and a half degrees or if it would warm four and a half degrees. But the average number is three. And that is the, 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 the number that has been used in, in all the, the translation of the climate science into climate policy. So for example, in the Paris Climate Agreement, it is the number three of climate sensitivity that has been the basis for the Paris Climate Agreement and the global carbon budget that has you know, given us this pathway to, to try and decarbonize the world economy by 2050, to reach zero emissions by 2050. The remaining budget originates from that number three. Now, in the run-up now to the sixth assessment of the IPCC, which is to be finished next year, I mean, there will be some delays because of COVID-19, the global climate models have run through their, their sixth iteration of climate model into comparisons, the so-called CMIP-6 runs, and, and 40 models have um, submitted their results. And this is where the concern arises because 35%, I mean, that's a significant number of these 40 models show a climate sensitivity jumping up from three to an average of 4.5 yeah. or even exceeding 4.5. So if you have for 30 years, or almost 40 years, uh, an uncertainty range from 1.5 to 4.5 and an average of three, now suddenly you have 35% of the models with an average exceeding 4.5. And, and that, that in itself is a concern. But what, what increases the concern further is that, as shown by Zelinka et al. in a paper quite recently, there is um, uncertainty and debate and, and, and discussions around this, but there's also you know, explanations which are related to the improvements in these climate models to represent climate uh, cloud dynamics. So there is a, um, a risk that, that this estimate could potentially have an explanation in, in climate physics because it seems to be a result of the fact that when the planet warms, yes, you get more water vapor. You would think then that you would get more clouds, which would potentially shade the planet more and, and reflect more heat back to space. But what the, the, the field evidence increasingly shows is that that's not the case, uh, that on the long run, clouds at, at the low altitude, particularly in the Southern Ocean, would be thinning out potentially, and you would get less clouds covering particularly ocean areas in the Southern Hemisphere, which then would contribute to a net positive feedback of warming. So of course that is a concern. Yeah. And, and, and this is what, what has uh, led to this uh, quite intricate uh, debate within the, the scientific community, because things are not settled in any way. I mean, there are many people who are critical to, to, to the findings so far in these models because they say, well, look here, this is, uh, this is not resolved yet and we still have to look into this more deeply. And, and the crit critiques, which I respect very much, and I'm also, you know, myself 
uh, not knowing what what foot to stand on really on, on what the final outcome is i have for example colleagues in my own institute at the potsdam institute stefan ramstorff who's one of the leading oceanographers and paleoclimatologists and and his conclusion is that it's very difficult to explain uh, a five degrees celsius climate sensitivity which would be a tremendous jump from three when you look at the paleoclimatic record because if you look one million years back it's difficult to reproduce that glacial interglacial cycling with such a high climate sensitivity i then try to raise with him well that is not entirely correct because even james hansen in his early works of, of one of the leading nasa climate modelers in in his efforts of reproducing the glacial interglacial cycling over the past three million years plus actually i mean back uh, into the you know pliocene era show that there are really warm periods warm interglacial periods where climate sensitivity seems to have been as high as four degrees so the the you know the jury is still out but there's certainly um, reason to be concerned over the fact that uh, that this is now on the table i should also say that what what makes me um, you know additionally concerned here is that among these 35 percent of models showing um, you know climate sensitivity exceeding 4.5 degrees again a very very high number these are not any models these are among these you have uh, the uk met office hadley model you have uh, um, you know you have the the big european community model you have uh, the big french climate model you have uh, the, the EU uh, Earth 3 model. So these are, it, it, it's not as if it's uh, fringe models showing these results. These, these are some of the, uh, the most reliable um, climate or Earth system models that we have today. So of course, th this, this does raise, um, raise the question, have we underestimated the sensitivity of, of the planet? And you mentioned clouds and, and the, the impact that clouds have. I mean, are clouds understand better understanding clouds the key to unlocking some of this information? What role will clouds play in, in our understanding of climate sensitivity? Well, you know, um, it's it's always been known that that clouds are, uh, you know, an area of uncertainty, um, deep uncertainty. They're very complex. They both cool and warm. Um, Climate skeptics have often used cloud dynamics as a as a way of uh, trying to explain, without being based in any science, that the planet might not warm as much as we think, because a warmer planet gets more water vapor, gets more clouds, and thereby it should, uh, so to say, cool itself. So, so clouds are are complicated, but I would argue that no, clouds are certainly not the only factor. So, I should say that what well, what makes me potentially additionally concerned and, and worried is that, you know, when I saw these numbers the first time with higher climate sensitivity, um, I did not make my, the first connection to clouds. I would have thought first and foremost that it was a result of, uh, of uh, previous underestimates of cooling aerosols, because there has been a lot of scientific evidence to show that the IPCC in the IPCC, there's been a tendency of, of underestimate the cooling of sulfates and nitrates. So, so cooling particles in the atmosphere coming also from, from different industrial and transport systems of burning fossil fuels and using fertilizers. And, um, and that these nitrates and sulfates, um, if, if you underestimate that and, the, and if the cooling is larger, then, of course, when you run the climate models over long time and assume that these air pollutants disappear, that would lead to more warming. So it would mean that we have potentially been, been hiding, hiding warming. by so we, so we warm by carbon dioxide, but then we cool with aerosols. And if you take away the aerosols, of course, the planet gets even more warm. And in fact, now during COVID-19, this is something we may be observing because it's a paradox that when cities get cleaner, thanks to less burning of fossil fuels and, and less diesel cars on the street, we get cleaner air, but also thereby more heat and thereby warming. So 
So that's what I thought. But but the, but what I predominantly uh, have been expecting, which is my area of research, is is really to understand Earth system feedbacks. You know the the big tipping points in the Earth system, like permafrost thawing, like the biological pump in the ocean, like uh, what happens when the big continental ice sheets melt, what happens when soils and, and, and temperate and, and rainforest capacity to take up carbon dioxide is reduced, what happens when forest fires abruptly increase in frequency and magnitude. But these are apparently not explaining this increase in climate sensitivity. So, so this, this potentially very large jump from three to above 4.5, does not appear to be explained through tipping points among the planetary boundaries of your system, but rather in a better representation of cloud dynamics. That, of course, raises even further concern because let's assume that that, that it is, as many critics say, that that is, is, is not well represented yet, that, that the models may be exaggerating uh, the climate sensitivity and that we haven't got a good handle yet on cloud dynamics. But on the other hand, we're not very well at representing all the tipping elements that, that, that we know have only one direction, which is to cause amplified warming. Right. And um, so there are these, these additional reasons to, to take this kind of work very, very seriously. And finally, to add one, one additional element that, that you know, kind of adds one further element of concern from my side is that even, even the equilibrium climate sensitivity, which again is defined as being, you know, where will the climate, where will the global mean temperature settle once we reach a new equilibrium? But that is, is run just over 150 years in the models. So that, that's the kind of the protocol to, uh, in fact, the protocol is, is, to, is to quadruple the amount of carbon dioxide in, in one blast and then run the model 150 years, see where the temperature ends up, divide by two, and then you get the climate sensitivity for a doubling of carbon dioxide. However, we have so much scientific evidence that 150 years is a very short time period, that that, that can only capture the fast feedbacks. But it, and the fast feedbacks is water vapor. It is uh, sea ice, when you lose sea ice, when you lose snow, snow cover, and when you change aerosols. So air pollutants, snow, uh, sea ice, and water vapor. These are the fast feedbacks, but the slow feedbacks, those are, for example, when you lose the Greenland ice sheet, yeah. when you lose West Antarctica, when you change the composition of, uh, of forests from dark to change colors, when you have big, big shifts in albedo, the reflectivity of incoming solar radiation, but that takes more than 150 years. So even the so-called equilibrium climate sensitivity is not an equilibrium climate sensitivity. It's, it's just a, it's kind of a more effective climate sensitivity. But if you really want to know uh, what the implications are of our burning of fossil fuels today, you need to look at longer time steps than 150 years. So, so to summarize, this is a reason for concern. It's not settled, but it is a reason for concern. But the, but the causes so far seems to be cloud dynamics. But because, and that's not settled yet, you could argue, but because there's reason to be concerned over other tipping points, and because there's reason to be concerned of what happens with our home planet even beyond 150 years, if you package all that together, the, you know, the, the direction of course is that climate sensitivity may be rising. And, and that would actually be very much in line with, uh, with uh, Jim Hansen's work over the years. He actually concluded already, you know, in the 1990s that, that long-term climate sensitivity is, is around four, five, or potentially even six degrees. Yeah. So, so you know, it's, a, it's, it's, um, it's not a settled area. I have great respects for those who, um, you know, like Richard Bett at the Met Office and Reto Knati, at ETH in, in Zurich and Stefan Ramsdorf at my own institute who are, you know, carefully skeptical about these results. I think we should look at them very carefully and have a discussion on this and just have an honest, uh, you know, uh, look into and turn every stone because this is, after all, 
what we could call the Holy Grail, because, I mean, just to give you one example, if the models are correct, if, if the uh, climate sensitivity would be five degrees Celsius, not three, then you can very rapidly show that the, the remaining carbon budget for 1.5 degrees Celsius would vanish entirely. Yeah. So, yeah. so the implications would actually be that immediately, as, 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 as of tomorrow morning, we would have lost 1.5 degrees Celsius, that that window would have closed already. So it does matter. I mean, knowing if it's three or three and a half or four makes a big difference. Well, it makes such a big difference in the international implications for how we have to respond to that politically and economically, right? This is this was supposed to be, 2020 was supposed to be the year that we started to hammer out the details of the Paris Agreement. And that's just completely changed by, by what these models could be showing, right? Well, yes. Yes and no. I mean, here, here it's a very good point you make here. And I think it's uh, my, my way my advice of how to handle this, and this is very much in line with, with Stefan Ramstorff, for example, who is quite critical here, that you're right, that this, this creates uncertainty and it, and it puts a big question. However, what this, what this does, which is in a way, I think very helpful, is that not so many years back, the debate was basically, is, is the climate sensitivity three degrees or could it be lower? Could it be lower? Yeah. There was, you know, you had people like Leonard Bengtsson, uh, formerly at the Max Planck Institute. You have uh, my own dear friend and colleague Henning Rode at the um, Metrological Department at Stockholm University and others who, who kind of, after the, um, you know, the hiatus when, when global warming seemed wrongly, to kind of stall briefly uh, from 1998 and, and um, seven, eight years after that, there was this discussion of whether climate sensitivity could actually be lower than three degrees Celsius, which, which confused much, much more, which, which gave uh, uh, energy to, uh, to climate skeptics like Bjorn Lomborg and others, th those who don't question the science, but say that, look here, perhaps the planet is not so sensitive after all, so we don't have to be so concerned. Uh, we, we need to be more concerned with providing cheap energy to, to poor people. I mean, that's yeah. often the argument. Right. But now, now we've, we, we have come to this very importantly, uh, you know, positive situation that we're no longer debating if it could be lower than three. We're debating whether it's three or higher. And, and because three degrees Celsius as climate sensitivity is, is, is more than enough to declare climate emergency. So, you know, 100 countries have declared climate emergency based on the science that tells us that climate sensitivity is three degrees Celsius. And I support that. That is enough because already three degrees Celsius gives us only 10 years to cut global emissions by half. And it gives us 30 years to become fossil fuel free in the entire world. Now, if the number goes higher than three, it pinches you know, we lose another number of years. It, get, it becomes even tougher. But, but we, don't, we don't need, we, we, we strictly speaking don't need uh, to climb higher to, to move uh, the entire world and have all hands on deck to really transform towards a decarbonized sustainable future. So you could, you could, you could actually argue that, okay, so there is a scientific debate. Okay, let the scientists fight this out. It's still a bit uncertain. But but it shows the it it shows the trajectory of, of travel. It shows that either the planet is at three, and and we have an emergency, or it might potentially be even more challenging. So let's let's move. You know why? Right. Why take the risk? So in that sense, we've moved the whole debate to a completely different uh, side of of the court, and and that. I think is, is very positive. That's why I want this to be in the, in the public domain. I mean, um, because it hasn't been really. I mean, Fred Pierce wrote about it in February. Uh, John Watt wrote about it in The Guardian. Uh, you and I are talking now. But I, I think it, it, should be, uh, it, it should be out there. And, uh, because, um, and, and, and be quite honest by the fact that 
this is not settled, but it's but these are important. This is how science works. You know, you're you're advancing and then critically revising and then advancing critically revising. Well, think about what what better example to think about science that is still developing urgency, emergency when we think about the current pandemic. And I'm wondering, as a climate climate scientist, what you've been feeling, what you've been thinking as you've watched this current pandemic unfold, knowing that we have another crisis that we are going to need collective action and urgency to respond to as well. What, what have you been thinking watching this unfold the last few months? Mm. No, there are, of course, many thoughts I, I can imagine, but and, and, and many thoughts because there is a lot of scientific evidence to, to conclude that also COVID-19, the corona crisis, is a manifestation of, of the Anthropocene. It's, a, it's not an isolated crisis. It's interconnected with the climate crisis right. and with the ecological crisis, particularly the ecological crisis, because it's a zoonosis. It's a virus spillover from, you know, from wild animals, potentially by domestic animals to humans. It risks rising with uh, deforestation, with uh, human encroachment on natural habitats, expansion of agriculture and unsustainable interactions with wildlife and, and wet markets and trade and travel in a hyper-connected world. So this is, this is uh, not a black swan. It is something that you can expect in this hyper-connected, globalized, turbulent world we live in. Now, the best investment to reduce risks of future pandemics is to build resilience. And how do you build resilience? Well, you keep global warming at bay so you don't lose even more natural habitats and you avoid expanding agriculture to keep natural ecosystems intact. So yes, you're right. My thoughts here are that the, the pandemic is, is, is another you know, piece of, of evidence and gives further uh, you know, injection to the need to accelerate the transformation towards a manageable future for, for humanity. So that's one reflection. The other one, I should say that I have been positively surprised at how at how early in this uh, COVID nineteen crisis it has become, you know, you could say morally acceptable to talk about climate, ecology, environment, and health. That you know nobody has come forward and say, oh, so now we have a health crisis and now we have to save lives, and you're kind of just surfing along on this crisis to, to, to defend your climate agenda. Oh no, I feel that uh, you know, societies, decision makers, communities understand that you know, the, 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 the corona crisis is a global crisis that is interconnected with nature. It has, it has all, the, all the couplings with climate and nature and therefore uh, we need to address it in, in that way. And then finally, you know, there, there's, um, there's of course nothing good with a disastrous health crisis like this pandemic, but we learn a lot. And, and, and one thing we've learned is that we can, at very short notice, rise as a world community. And we are actually able to do you know, actions that we never would consider possible to solve the climate crisis, because suddenly we put 11 trillion US dollars on the table as stimulus packages to recover after the corona crisis. And I think a positive effect of this crisis is that never more will it be morally or ethically or practically possible to fight, for example, over, over whether or not we can generate $100 billion to, to solve the climate crisis when we put trillions of dollars into the corona crisis. It's like, it's peanuts, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the environmental crisis uh, we've just played it lip service in terms of money compared to what we are able to mobilize for the COVID-19 situation. So I, I think we, it might help us to, to put the priorities a bit more safely on, 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 you know, be more grounded in the way we advance these agendas. But, um, but of course, it's too early to say, I mean, the, the, the big question mark on, on, what comes, what do we rise back to is out there. I mean, as you know, many, many are arguing 
that the biggest mistake we can do is to bounce back to the pre-COVID world. Well, many, many businesses around the world put a lot of pressure to do just that. But on the other hand, the European Union, for example, put forward a stimulus package of 750 billion euros, which is uh, tied to the Green Deal to accelerate the decarbonization of the economy. And uh, no, it's so, you know, we'll see. Yeah, we're still, uh, unfortunately, we're still arguing about mask here in the, in the United States. So uh, it's a, what a <laughs> just uh, unfortunate time in, in many ways. But I, I, I want to remain hopeful, just like you, like you said. And that was, I just want to ramp up here. I was watching a conversation on Earth Day that you had with uh, activist Greta Thunberg. And in it, you both talked about 2020 as being, you know, the super year for climate. And that's this inflection point for cutting carbon emissions. When, when climate scientists talk about 2020 as the super year, what, what, what do they mean? Mm. Well, this, it, is, it is a super year in, in several ways, and I'll close by saying what happened with the super year. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a super year, number one, because it's five years into the, into the Paris Climate Agreement, and it's five years into the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So it's a, it's a moment of global accounting. Are we doing what we promised in Paris with the legally binding climate agreement? at the United Nations General Assembly in 2015 with, with adopting sustainable development goals. We know that we're not doing good progress. So this was the, the year of reckoning, the year of truth to, to really ramp up ambition, put all the efforts on, on delivering on these decisive agendas. So that's one reason why it, it is a super year. The second reason, which is more important in my mind, is that there are no pathways of climate that can take us to Paris unless we bend the global curve of emissions 2020. So it's like there are over 100 uh, climate model scenarios that, that show what will it take to, to keep global warming well below 2 and aiming for 1.5. And all the successful ones, I should start by saying that all of them assume negative emissions second half of the century. So so they have already admitted, scientifically, we have already admitted that we've gone too far. We, we will have to you know, start absorbing carbon through different forms of carbon capture storage systems. But still, you need to bend the curve no later than 2020 because you know, the, the only thing that matters is, is the global budget. How much can you emit every year? Because carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a thousand years. So what you emit today Basically, you could think of it stays forever and warms the world forever. So, and if you bend today, you can, you can in, reduce emissions by six, 7% per year and then land reasonably softly 2050. If we delay, then of course, the pace of, of, uh, of reduction is even steeper. But you know, when, when the annual global reduction pace, I mean, already six, 7% is extraordinarily high. I mean, it's so high you could call it revolution high, but 10% is, is like, it's impossible to see any realistic evidence that we could do it. So it's a super year in the sense that the global emission curve needs to bend. The global curve of loss of natural ecosystems need to bend. The global curve of loss of biodiversity needs to bend to have a chance of landing Within, within the safe space of planetary boundaries, to be able to land the Paris Agreement. So that is why 2020 is the super year. Now, what has happened with this super year is that COVID-19 put a pause button on 2020. So we have lost it. We've lost that year. Is that a problem? Well, my conclusion at least so far is that the answer is no. That we can simply play the game that we, we, we will simply, you know, erase this this year from our our conscience you know this was the disaster year of COVID-19 so we pushed the super year to 2021 instead we kind of play the game that the that this decisive decade starts next year instead can we do that yeah well actually <clears throat> uh, scientifically it appears we can because COVID-19 has paradoxically had this impact that we have bent the curves the, the global curve emission has bent temporarily because of the slowdown in the global economy. That's the wrong 
it, it's, it's the wrong method to deliver on Paris because we cannot kind of basically knock the economy over to deliver on Paris, but, but temporarily gave us some breathing space. So the planet has given us, you know, the COVID-19 is a disaster, but because of the implications, the planet has given us a bit of breathing space so we can start our, our bending uh, point next year instead, and then move decisively toward, along, the, along the, the scientific trajectory that we need, namely cutting emissions by half every decade. So, so it is a super year, but I think we can uh, still, you know, everyone has pushed all the big events to next year instead. Right, and I think, right. uh, and these events, events are important because these are for businesses and city mayors and heads of state and civil society groups to get together and just drum up the, the momentum, you know, and I mean, there is already a momentum, but the momentum has to be, you know, amplified. Absolutely. So let's hope that we get that support and that sense of urgency and we start taking action. And Dr. Rockstrom, you've been extraordinarily generous with your time and your insight. And I apologize for my, my terrible American pronunciation of your name, but uh, I so greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join the Clam Pod. No, a pleasure talking to you. Really good conversation. Thanks.